Um, so this is um, the second in our series of Artists Beyond the Studio, um, which is something that we're doing in Graphic Studio Dublin during the lockdown. Um, we just thought it might be um, a good way of keeping in touch and keeping everyone with sort of something something nice and bright on the horizon on this uh, wet, wet and windy day. Um, so I'm really pleased to introduce Ruth O'Donnell to you all. Um, Ruth is an artist member. She's currently serving on the board of directors of Graphic Studio Dublin. Originally from Galway, she studied at the Institut Saint-Luc in Brussels and she joined GSD in 1991. Um, her work references art history, literary sources and museum pieces, as well as um, personal references. Ruth's prints often use techniques that allow for a fluidity and a lightness of touch, um, which align it closely with her drawing and painting practice. She has become a master of sugar lift. I think there's no doubt about that. Managing to lift and etch the most delicate of uh, subtle lines of drawing. Um, her drawing and painting practice run in tandem with her printmaking. Uh, she works constantly through sketchbooks and notebooks, sometimes binding them um, into her own beautiful um, pieces using uh, bookbinding techniques. When I think of Ruth's work, the word fluency comes to my mind. Her drawings and sketchbooks are always on the go, simmering away in the background. Um, and because of this, the ideas are consistently being worked out and there's a wealth of source material there, wherever her research takes her. I guess I'm interested in hearing her talk about these journeys, the work, the process, the chance and the serendipity and how the sketchbooks and the etchings sit so comfortably together in her practice. Um, Ruth has a little bit of animation work as well. It's sort of a video animation that she's gonna show us at the start. And she's gonna take us through some, some of her works, uh, her sketchbooks and her prints. So I hope you all enjoy it. So, hi, everybody. Um, looking forward to talking to you this morning about what I've been doing during 2020. And I'm talking mostly about our uh, drawing sketchbooks and where those led me. So this is a kind of drawing that I've been doing for a while. I started to do it as a performance um, where I actually put some objects down on paper before I start the drawing. This is quite good when there's an audience, but it's, if you don't have an audience, which we didn't have this year, uh, this is an, a way of filming it, which is a tiny camera called a Raspberry Pi. It's a small computer. Um, have it on a tripod um, over the work area, a screen in front of me. And I had to, with this, learn to write a few lines of code to tell the camera what I wanted it to do. So just start this here and see that this is not a how to draw video. You can make um, stop motion videos on your phone, but they don't have the quality this has of being much more under your control. So this is not telling anyone else how to draw, but it's just showing what I do when I'm drawing. The main thing I have to do is to try to see and what I'm doing here is trying to see this little piece of lace. Now, the object itself is um, both the lace and the jet beads. They're all 19th century objects. They're things that uh, would have been part of clothing and that were saved afterwards by, for the next generation. And I've seen, in fact, a photograph where this little piece of lace is on a dress dating for about, from about 1904. What you might notice or not notice there is that sometimes what's in my hand is a pen and sometimes it's a brush. And I alternate between these two when I'm drawing all the time. This is the second piece. And here I'm just looking at the color blue. I'm looking at it in three ways, a piece of actual lapis lazuli a shape and a letter, which is about meaning. This is the third one. This one is on my Instagram page as well. And this is about how there are two points of view. I'm making a circle within a square here. Um, I'm not going to take away the objects this time as it's finished. But what you can see more particularly here is that your view is not my view. The overhead view of the camera and the view of the artist are not the same. And that's perhaps the, the point of this one.
The second kind of drawing I was doing were drawing in sketchbooks. I've been keeping sketchbooks for a long time. I think the earliest ones are probably uh, 1980s. And usually I have a sketchbook with me wherever I go. You can see a selection of them here on the shelves. They're all kinds. It depends on what I'm doing, what the project is, where I am, if I'm traveling or I'm at home, um, if I'm making a block of work or just uh, making notes of a particular event. I began the year 2020. Actually, this was a notebook that I started on the 1st of January. It's a homemade notebook. I learned how to bind books in the graphic studio. This was a very enjoyable thing to do. And I made this notebook with just four pages because I just wanted to make a few drawings on a trip to Galway on the 1st of January. And this was a very personal trip, um, so I'm not going to places where you might go as a tourist. I'm going to places that meant something to me. This is the coffee shop in the college. Now that was still, there was still the freedom to travel at that point. I'm jump to, jumping forward a little bit here to March, where by now uh, we were confined to home. And I started to do what a lot of people did at lockdown, which is to start to tidy up the studio. And I started to tidy up uh, the shelves that I have and I keep things in my studio according to color on shelves. And I think of it as a palette. So I decided to tidy up the yellow shelf. And it wasn't, uh, of course, a coincidence that uh, yellow was on my mind. We were all had just encountered the yellow leaflet and the yellow warnings. But that's where, where I began. Um, the things that are on the shelf, they may seem quite random. They're not a collection, but they're an accumulation of objects. So they all have different sources. This one, I think, came from a Christmas cracker. It's a magic wand. And uh, I was at this, as I was reading leaflets at the same time, I sometimes put a random word in there. That's government. That's what do we expect from government now? This was a, a fiendish little uh, toy that I think I probably confiscated from a grandchild, which was, a, and it's a laughing box. But laughter was missing. And even smiles were hard to come by. But I settled down to actually just liking the exercise of, of drawing um, and, you know, the, being appreciative of the tools that I had and the space that I had to do it. I quite like this one because, of course, it's the yellow pencil and obviously I had to use that pencil to draw itself. Getting used to the home as workplace was another part of this, and this is uh, paying attention to the tools you have. Everything began to take on a little more intensity and meaning, so the most ordinary object became well worth drawing. You also find on a shelf like this is something from your past. This is uh, an ashtray. It's a very long time since I gave up smoking, but uh, I never threw out this ashtray. It's got pictures of dancing girls on it. And this, again, a little wooden model that um, reminding us to keep our distance. I had an issue with whether the wooden pieces belonged on the yellow shelf, but you need yellow paint to paint them. So I've included them there. So while I worked my way through that sketchbook, and it was it was not a homemade one, it was a um, uh, nice paper, but just cartridge paper, um, sketchbook, but about 100 pages in it, I think 93 pages in it. And I was just coming back to the end of it when I got a phone call from Don Leary Arts Office, inviting me to take part in a scheme they called Artworks Home, where they would be sending out small artworks to people who had, were cocooning and who were borrowing library books. And I was delighted to be asked to do it. And I thought at first that I might, I would, would, might use um, pages from the sketchbook, but I didn't do that, partly because I don't like taking pages out of a sketchbook, but also I thought that the um, drawings should be on slightly better paper. And I, I had a very nice watercolor paper that I used instead. So I just drew everything again, not everything. This time I made a different selection from within my 90 images. I picked out 25, which I thought would work for other people. Because one of the differences between the sketchbook and what the work that you send out to a gallery or wherever is that what goes out, what's in the sketchbook may just relate to you, but what goes out relates to somebody else. So it's a bit like the points of view that I talked about 
in the, in the uh, stop motion images. So this is a little hexagon piece of a patchwork quilt that never got finished. Um, the It's yellow and white gingham, which is still available, but you'll never see that exact color again because that's a 1950s dye and things have changed. I, I redo, I feel that this is something that other people can relate to as well. You just want to pick that up. And uh, another little teapot that was um, a, a teapot for one person. Just social isolation isn't always bad. So these were the 25 pieces that went to the John Leary project uh, and they made their way out into the world. And what I liked about them when they started to see them, this is the difference again between a sketchbook. Now I could see them all together spread out. And um, at that's point you realize that yes, everything is a metaphor. I've been used to working in multiple images and seeing them together in the uh, prints that I make. And uh, this, this is one nice thing that happened again about being able to get work out during the summer. Had a short exhibition in the Dower House Gallery in County Leash, but County Leash got closed down soon afterwards and it was a short lived, but it was really nice once again to get some work out from the studio into place where someone else would see it. So this is a second kind of sketchbook that uh, I'm going to go through now. And this one is quite different in that it's, it's um, the outcome of an idea. So I started this sketchbook with the question, which was uh, while I'd been looking at uh, paintings and you could see in that, that previous, uh, many of these images come from paintings or they come from museum objects. So I went back to looking at paintings to see the objects in paintings, uh, if they're not in still lives, if they're in uh, different kind of works, who has what? And I went to look at what do women have in paintings? Just got a, picked up a little sketchbook in, uh, I think in the bookshop in the National Gallery. And I started to have a little walk around and see what, what was there a difference between the kind of objects that men and women have. So the first thing you discover is usually uh, women in paintings, they're, they're usually holding a child. And, uh, but I did notice that in this first image that also a very beautiful blue cloak. And then there was the St. Agnes, which is uh, holding a lamb. So in religious paintings, uh, people have something, the women will have something that relates to uh, their, their role or their status. Um, where in a portrait, um, it, it, there, there's often very little, um, and where they represent a story, there'll be something that's telling in terms of si a sign. So this was, uh, there was the contrary to what you might expect. Uh, sometimes a woman would have a dagger, that's Lucretia. Judith had a sword. The daughters of Lot had wine jugs. I started to look at, and maybe in a slightly different way of what were the objects around me. Um, this was a, a board meeting in the graphic studio. I seemed to have a water bottle and a glass. And the following day I was playing cards. There's a date, dates on this, that's the 28th of January. On the 29th, I seemed to have had some issue about keys. There's the keys in my front door. On the 3rd of February, uh, when we could still travel, I went to London and um, I was traveling up to the north of England the following day to visit my son, but I managed to get to see an exhibition in the Royal Academy of Picasso and paper. And I went there with the same sketchbook in my pocket because, you know, I would have and um, just, I didn't find very much on my theme in Picasso, maybe not surprisingly, but there were some dishes. Uh, in the Saltenbachs. And in fact, there was another piece which I, I, it's on the next page of this, but I haven't got it for you here, which was um, uh, Salome and she has the head of John the Baptist on a plate. On the 6th of February, on my way back through London again, I managed to get to see uh, an exhibition of Dora Maar in the Tate Modern. Uh, Dora Maar was uh, 
a photographer and painter and it was interesting to see in the first instance her photographs of her studio where I got to see her props so not perhaps a yellow shelf but nevertheless a selection of objects which she had for putting into paintings the bird in a cage there were glasses and plates on a table um, a mirror and it was interesting the studio itself that she had a clock uh, watching the time um, her materials, light, and most importantly, I suppose, a room of her own, which is a space to work. I was thinking of Virginia Woolf. The kind of things that she was photographing as belonging to women included a car, lottery tickets, and a cat. You can see there's an emergence out into a, a different kind of world. Soon after I uh, completed that sketchbook, um, I was invited by Galway County Libraries to make a submission for a project that they were doing called their Galway Great Read series, where the Galway-born writer Eilish Dillon, uh, they were celebrating 100 years of her birth. And I, ma I made a submission to that would be based on the kind of things that were that I'd been thinking about when I was making up the notebook is what are the signs and attributes of uh, an active woman? And in particular, how would I go about this? So I looked back to um, when I'd been, the a large print that I made um, 2019 for an exhibition in the graphic studio and the Hamilton galleries. And I made a hundred small plates and printed them all together but when looking back afterwards, I thought, oh, the plates were really nice. And I decided to make plates this time as the actual work. I didn't make 100. I, I, there were, on, back at that time, I printed groups of 25 sometimes as well. And I thought that's actually quite a nice size for, for this project. So what I proposed to Galway that I was that I would make uh, 25 plates. They'd be um, sugar lift etching, so they'd be quite very much a drawing on the plate, um, which would be inked up, uh, but they would not be printed. And the plate would be the thing. The nice thing about these, and actually you can see it happening there, is that this is a piece that's going to hang in a library and it will reflect the books. So I began to work my way through the ideas that I had about um, what my, my proposal was accepted by the um, uh, selection committee. And I then had to make work my way through the ideas. So I had uh, the idea of having a series of rows of images, as I had done in these prints, where each row would have a, a significance. And they were going to be have to do with uh, the weight of history, the place of childhood, the habit of work, and the outcomes of, of writing. And I'll, I'll show you in a moment how the series came together, but this is in relation to um, how I made, how I draw images from um, paintings. These are all notebooks that I had with me in galleries going to look at exhibitions. And in the middle right here, you'll see there's an image of a Correggio Madonna of the basket, it's called, where there's a detail in the corner of a painting. And in it, I, what I did was to recreate that corner, um, you know, with a real basket, wool and scissors. And I made this monoprint, um, you know, a good few years ago now. But it's interesting to look back on it. Because what I also did was to look at the individual objects in that as the dramatis personae. And for this project, I was looking at the idea of knitting again, but this time the knitting is from the point of view of the child. And this is about a child learning to knit. So the same objects can have a different meaning. This is another reference that I took as, uh, which, and this object is a, a mariner's compass, which I saw in first in a uh, painting by Artemisia Gentileschi. So it's um, early 17th century. The Mariner's Cosmos had just been invented by Galileo and um, Artemisia Gentileschi knew him. She included this object in one of her paintings. 
title of the painting is, uh, I think um, it's the an allegory of inclination and it's about natural talent. I like the idea of natural talent being a sense of direction, and particularly in relation to a writer that seemed to be very much to the point. I was looking also at actual objects uh, which were relevant. Kind of time, this is, a, now this is uh, just to show you the way I work with sugar lift. This is a drawing on copper. I, it's drawn in various inks um, and I go on to put a layer of varnish over that. You put that plate then into warm water. Here's another one within the water. The drawing then lifts off leaving open copper which you then bite in acid and you get the bitten plate. So you're, you're your hand-drawn image, which, which is a, you know, if it's a loose drawing or it's a whatever, freehand drawing is then etched into the plate. So these are the full set of images and I'll just go through what the ideas were here, as I mentioned. Leash Dillon's had an interesting life. Uh, her family background was, uh, refer is referred to in the top row here. Top left-hand corner, that uh, cord and urn, which you, we saw being made there, that's uh, uh, from uh, the National Museum. Leish Dillon's grandfather, the Count Plunkett, was the director of the National Museum up to 1916. And next to that, I have a piece of seaweed. Seaweed is, uh, this is a reference to her father, um, Professor Tom Dillon, who was a professor of chemistry in Galway with a particular interest in seaweed. Uh, and uh, still of interest to, to chemists as a possible source of um, uh, pharmaceutical products, I think they're talking about now, but it's, uh, it was an, for industrial processes. The third image is an image of Galway, but it's not literal. Uh, it's the elements of Galway, the river, bridge, the mill, and the cathedral. But the cathedral actually was built on the site of what was formerly the jail in Galway, where uh, Alicia Dillon's mother was taken in 1921, when, when Alicia herself was, was one year old. The next one is a rose, and that's uh, a reference to her uncle, Joseph Plunkett, the 1960 leader and poet. That's a reference to his poem that we all know best. And the last one is a, a vase which belonged to her grandmother, Countess Plunkett, and which um, I actually have on my green shelf. The next row is a row that refers to the place of childhood and uh, her writing, most of her writing is writing for children. There's a lot of children's books. Um, she's written about 50 books altogether. I think maybe 40 of those are for children. So the place of childhood, uh, literally was the west of Ireland. So I have a wild orchid here, stone wall with a gap in it, which is for Barna, a village where they lived very happily. The centre pieces are a small chair, which is a reference to listening. You can see the knitting there, they're le about learning to do things. And in the centre, two birds, one drinking and one singing. And that's about finding a voice. The third line down, Here's the mariner's compass with the sense of direction. And this line is about uh, the habit of work. There's the clock as it's been etched in and the pen drawing is now on, on copper. It's the kind of uh, book that she liked to write in, writing on the right hand page, uh, corrections on the left, very few of them there. And an Olivetti typewriter, which is the, the kind of typewriter that she used at one stage. The last two rows are something different are about how the work went out. And what's interesting as well is that, that um, the, the children's books are still widely read. Uh, they, uh, they're on in um, some of them still available in print and others in libraries. But they, a lot of her works were translated into other languages. And in fact, she's translated into 18 languages. And I've used the vases here as a sort of metaphor of that, of how um, a story can be carried out to another place and how ideas are transmitted as well as objects moving. So I've, I've used, for examples, um, a Chinese vase 
um, one from an ancient Roman wall. She lived in Rome for a time as well. There's a French uh, vase or jug here, which is actually a design for a jug rather than an actual one. That's so the concept of the I ideas passing. Um, a milk jug, the, the wholesomeness of, of her work. That's from a Vermeer painting and um, a flower vase. I've also put in references to, to her love of music, to her own actual travels and an allegory of the arts. She was a member of the Arts Council. And the last piece here is a, a torch, which is actually from a Raphael drawing of, for, of a, a Sibyl reading with, with a child seemed appropriate and also it's a reference to how Elise Dillon passed the torch to another generation. So I committed that project um, in December, de delivered it to Galway and uh, just before Christmas, uh, very soon after there was a, the, the, the new lockdown happened. So it's actually hanging in the window of the library now, but will with, is in the Galway County Library's collection. So the year came to, to an end. Um, looking back, I realized what's missing out of my sketchbooks and it's mostly people. Uh, uh, that's something that, you know, I've, I would be in the habit of because I always have a sketchbook with me, uh, nobody's safe. <laughs> and also miss the studio. Um, that's just the corner where I, I most like to work. So that's it. That's uh, the end of the talk. Uh, that was great, Ruth. A, a lovely talk. Thanks very much. Uh, I have a question here. You constantly draw and your drawings are in a way a visual vocabulary that you can go back to again and again. But do you work on several things at once? Well, uh, yeah, the, the sketchbook, some I have different kinds of sketchbooks, as you probably saw there. And sometimes, uh, you know, the sketchbook in my pocket, if I come across something, um, that'll get make its way into the sketchbook. And then other times uh, I'm, I'm working, I have, a, I have a, something that I'm, uh, is an idea, and that, that will be the, I'll, I'll stay, be working on that idea. But once I get into a project, and if you like, like this one here, then I really focus on that. So while I was making this set of images, I really wasn't thinking about anything else. I put down everything else to just concentrate on this. And I think that you have to do that because you have to get the feeling that this is the most important thing. You know, if I'm just drawing a little screwdriver, I really have to see that as the most important thing in the world just now. And I, I do fo really focus on the particular when I'm get when I'm on, on a case, as it were. And uh, another question, do you draw from photographs? I don't really draw from photographs. I think you'll probably see that uh, where that I, I'm more interested in objects. There were some pieces that I had to, when I was working on the uh, project, there were one or two things that I could only get a photograph of. And I, I will work from photograph if, if I need to do that. And for instance, the, I couldn't get to see that typewriter. So I had a photograph of it. But what I did was to take out something that had that quality. So I, I pulled out a keyboard and looked at that while I was doing the drawing so that there's something in the room that relates to it. And I have a better feeling of the shape of it. And I think that what I feel is that I, I don't engage enough when I'm looking at photographs. But when I'm looking at an object, I, I'm aware of my, uh, the three dimensionality of it and I'm translating that into a two dimensional shape rather than going from two dimensional to two dimensional. I was just wondering about the sugar lift. You use a lot of sugar lift. Um, what sort of tools and, and techniques do you use in sugar lift? Yeah, I try to use uh, things that are as close to what I'd use in drawing as possible. So um, when I'm using watercolor, I often have a pen and then a water, water brush. Um, and actually, you might see on the table there in the, in the jar, there are some pens and uh, there, I have little brushes that have a reservoir of water in the handle. So when I go to use sugar lift, I try to draw as if I was drawing on anything else, try to draw on copper the same way that I draw on anything else. Instead of an, a, a, a pen, I'm, I use markers. And um, now there are two kinds of markers. There are markers that will lift as sugar lift and there are markers that will stop out. And the cheaper the marker you have, the more likely it is to sugar lift. 
to behave like sugar lift. So that's what I use for fine line drawings. I use um, ink pens, uh, ink brushes for uh, more painterly marks, for brush marks. And um, I sometimes use uh, uh, actual sugar and water, but it's a bit blobby. So if you want fine detail, I find that the little markers are what, and, and inks are what work best. Um, and another question here, uh, how many years of notebooks do you have and do you keep them all or do you call them every so often? Yeah, uh, no, I, I never call the notebooks. I think I have I have all the notebooks. That's a selection of them there. And they are different kinds. Some of them are um, uh, they're different sizes and shapes and they have different uh, kinds of things in them. But I, I do always keep them and I often find I, I, I like uh, going back and looking at things again. And also you find out what not to do again, because for instance, uh, drawing with pencil is something I've, I've you know, completely given up. And, and they d there are some notebooks there which were had uh, wire binding and that's not a great idea either. So uh, the kind of notebooks I like are, are uh, something that, you know, the, the notebook you have with you or uh, somebody asked me the question, what's the best notebook? I'd say it's the one with the best drawing in it. But the one you have with you is the one that gets used. So I like I've moved over to mostly having a small notebook that I can have in my bag or in my pocket. And that if it's always there, that's the one that uh, that's the one that has something valuable in it, not the one that's at home. <laughs> and another question, what uh, watercolor paints do you use and what sort of paper? Actually, yeah, this was uh, one of the tubes of watercolour featured in, in this little painting. They're Windsor & Newton, I think, artist quality. Um, it doesn't have to be that. I sometimes uh, use a Sennelier, but uh, I quite like these. But what I do is I tend to, um, I have a, a box of paints and I refill the pans from a tube. Uh, this, there's a certain amount of anxiety involved with that little painting there because that, that's my Naples yellow running out. The, the paper I was using there, uh, the good watercolour paper is a uh, Saunders Waterford, which I really like. I get it in big sheets from um, John Purcell papers and uh, it, I've both bound it in sketchbooks and use it for individual paintings. It's a lovely paper. So do you make any of your own sketchbooks? And um, Yes, I do. And uh, this this is one of the ones was uh, which I, I made for the Galway project. And the lovely thing about making your own sketchbook is you can make it the size you want. So um, this this one just had four pages, but there were four pages of really nice paper. And um, there's a certain satisfaction in the feel that it, you've made the whole object. I learned how to do this uh, from um, Elish Murphy's bookbinding workshops in the graphic studio, which are absolutely brilliant. Hope we're going to have another one soon. And it was nice. To, it's a nice sort of shared activity as well, putting putting books together and thinking about what you're going to put into them. Sometimes I've uh, bound uh, or made cylinder boxes to keep blocks of, of uh, paper together afterwards as well. If I've been drawing on um, individual pages, I will usually have had a particular size paper and then they can be uh, at least kept together. And uh, can the notebook sometimes be more important than the finished work? I think that the notebooks can be important and they can be a whole thing in themselves. And um, I, I must say I've, I've become quite fond of them. I have only once, I, I, I have sometimes exhibited them uh, but uh, and did actually sell a notebook once, but mostly I, I think that they have, um, you can see what you were thinking. That's what I like about them. So, and then as far as that's important, then, uh, you know, but that doesn't go away when you make a finished work but it's maybe encapsulated in a notebook in a slightly different way. And you can see the evolution of an idea where you're thinking about something and, um, you know, then something ordinary happens and then you're back, you know, with your idea again. So you get, what's nice about, about the notebooks is that you see, you know, how, how, how an idea evolved and what were the things that made you think. So um, drawings um, get better when you when you repeat them. Is that always the case? Yeah, I think that it is. Um, when I think about the the 
the, the um, John Leary project, these, these drawings, I, I drew all these things in a notebook first. And then when I drew them again, um, I was looking at them more individually and also uh, just paying attention in a slightly different way. But I often change something as well when, I, when I'm drawing again, whereas, uh, you know, change the format or the, or the paper or the uh, materials I'm using. But I think that drawing things again is very good for you. And I think that drawing in itself, uh, you know, the more of it you do, the better it is. So that drawing things again, um, you, I, I think that, that each time you see something else or you're paying a different kind of attention or it's a different day in your life, you know, in some ways you're a different person the next time you draw it. 